Thank you in advance and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, right. Good afternoon, good morning and good evening, uh, depending on where you are based. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, Delay Disruption and Prolongation webinar today. It's, uh, it's really pleasing to see the amount of people joining in and still the list growing. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a subject that never goes away. Uh, it's a subject that is quite huge in terms of causation of disputes. And some of the things I will mention today, you will, you will see it from one of the reports that HKA does, is, does a global causation report. So without further ado, first of all, I want to thank you, the Chartered Institution of Civil Engineering Surveys for hosting this, for making this webinar, because it's important that we keep learning. And I believe that the most important aspect of learning is by sharing your learning, by sharing your experiences, by discussing what you have got to say, and then through the questions and answers that you will ask, hopefully we will all have a clear discussion of where we want to be. Um, throughout today, the plan is to discuss delay, disruption and prolongation. And the idea is that by the end of this webinar, you will be able to recognize different types of delays in construction, identify the best practices of what different delay analysis methods are used, because at the end of the day, the reason why you are carrying out delay analysis is to recover cost that has been expended on the project. We will look at robustness of programs, analysis methods that suit your project, understand the basic principles, and then have a, a slight discussion in a bit more detail into recovering costs through prolongation and through disruption and what is the difference between them a bit about me uh, so i'm nasser khan i'm a principal at hka i work in the construction claims and expert services team uh, the practice is global and my work is in the uk in europe in africa in asia in the middle east in americas as well and uh, it keeps it exciting, it keeps it amazing because you meet different perspectives, you look at different complex situations. Um, I'm a keen advocate within the institution of diversity and inclusion. I was the first chair of the EDI committee. Um, at the moment, I have also been appointed uh, for a three-year term as the chair of the Construction Industry Council Liability Panel, and I'm also the vice chair for Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Pakistan branch. Uh, making remote working to its true effect. A bit about HKA, as I mentioned, it's world's leading consultancy, global in its scale, in terms of everything from advisory, claims, expert services, financial accounting, commercial damages, huge work in risk mitigation as well, because we, we all know avoidance is better than cure. Um, that's just, you know, the, the, in terms of numbers uh, based globally and um, the service offering is one of the key things that I'm really enjoying at the moment is on the same project, I'm working with people from four different continents and uh, it just brings in different perspective to how claims are avoided, analyzed, distributed. The basic principles are the same, but it's it's the overcoming the complex challenges is the important element and with this experience through dealing with a multitude of billions and billions of pounds of uh, claims and disputes hka produces its annual dispute causation report which is available to download and the reason of this webinar is somewhat looking at modern mega projects which are increasingly complex there is a cruel conundrum for the global construction and engineering industry um, the most common causes of claims and disputes are highly predictable uh, delay being one of them uh, change of scope uh, all these 
are standard issues. We all know about it, but still we are unable to achieve better outcomes and uh, lessons learned aren't really uh, being dealt with. So the statement, you know, forewarned is forearmed goes uh, pretty amazing from that perspective. And when you when you look at the regional overview, I just want to share a quick insight before we go into delay and disruption and prolongation issues. In Middle East, you're looking at 82% average extension of time claims. You know, there's 63.6% average EOT claimed on top of the existing duration of the project. I mean, these are massive numbers. And if you go onto the dashboard, you can actually see how this breaks down into sector, into region, into country, into cities, and all of those elements can go in. Um, just a small disclaimer, these are the projects that we have worked on. Of course, client confidentiality is uh, prime, and uh, it's only projects that we can reflect into. So it won't be the whole global picture, but it's a, a, a good idea in terms of how projects are being dealt with. So that was a quick five minute introduction. Now we move on to the key subject, delay. What we want to discuss in this is putting in the basic principles, just understanding the different types of delays, how to check the robustness of program, what are the methods of delay analysis, compensable and non-compensable period identification, and I'll, I'll go a bit more in detail on the compensable element because that's where we are looking at prolongation disruption and calculating the cost or what the most appropriate methods suitable to your project could be. So when we look into project delays, you know, delay is, is, is a common element of our life. And one of the key things we look into from a delay perspective is it's a it's a common sense element to it. You know, when when things happen, they happen for a reason. So I'm going to give some example of the cause of delays to, to talk about why delays happen. So these are just, you know, causes of delay. Think about it from the perspective you you want to get a delivery next day, it doesn't get delivered for another three days for whatever reason. One of the things that I have avoided and not put here is force majeure as a cause of delay. Force majeure is a completely different topic, is a completely different subject from the perspective. We are talking delays here from the perspective through which you will have some entitlement to claim an extension of time uh, and cost. Whereas when you look at a force majeure event, typically if you know a contractor gets an extension of time, uh, it's very unlikely uh, to recover uh, cost and uh, both parties generally look at their own perspective. Whereas what we are looking and focusing on today is the distinction of where you can have compensable and non-compensable delays and how to progress with that. I'm currently working on a project where it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a major major project major delay and the issues we are looking at several aspects of it. So one of the things that I haven't put here is concurrency as well, which a lot of you would be familiar with. Concurrent delays are are, are something different, uh, and when we look into the types of delays, it's if you, if you look at it, you know, uh, the causes of delay, not the types of delay, the delays could be very simply non-excusable delays. Now, non-excusable delays are where you are at fault and you are unable to produce the desired results as you planned. Excusable delays are where extension of time relates to relief of liquidated damages, you are changing the completion date of the program, et cetera. And um, I want to talk about uh, pacing delay is you plan something, but 
it's it's actually a non-excusable delay that arises for something which falls short or it's a contractor's risk and it could be an excusable delay but it is something which falls to the employer's risk but you have helped the employer and the pacing delay has occurred so the pacing delay is one where contractor says well although i ought to do this work according to my program but i honestly don't think that right now it would be best for me to do it so difficulty is to to continue with the program in the manner that the contractor planned because of various issues uh, compensable and non-compensable delays uh, you you will go through in a bit more detail uh, in the later stages of today's one hour discussion now i want to talk about you've got excusable non-excusable delays excusable delay grants extension of time and the key element that i want to discuss is what's the purpose of extension of time uh, the purpose of extension of time is to give a realistic cost to the client or realistic time when things will be finished and also it is to describe the elements of additional cost that the contractor has incurred in delivering those extensions so when you are looking to check your extension of time what elements are available i mean extension of time could be through your contract uh, you need to show the contemporaneous records there is additional cost it could be various uh, causes as we just looked at uh, there uh, one of our experts has recently been working on and uh, they were looking at over 2078 events different events that impacted the critical path of the program and um, my question was on this discussion what was the duration of the project okay duration of the project was just over six years and what was the delay on the project the delay on the project was just over 700 days so almost you know 60 70 percent delay or completion lateness and and this is where clients simply say i can give you an extension however you need to provide me with a justified method of showcasing how you have been delayed what is the cause of the delay how you are going to recover this delay and also if this delay was progressed what was the the key events that led to it so you are trying to do the cause and effect of the delay in terms of that and this is why when you go into the cause and effect element of trying to justify your delay we move into the delay analysis methods. Now, the method of analysis, which can be applied, and, and some would say if you do them after the event, um, it's, it's definitely retrospective. So, so one of the two things that we look at delay analysis methods is whether it is prospective or it is retrospective. The prospective element looks at cause and its effect, Whereas the retrospective, which is most common because generally we get appointed on projects when it's already in delay. So you're looking at, okay, on 1st of January, where was the project and where it should have been? And okay, it's say six months in delay. What are the reasons or causes of those delays? Are those attributable to the client? Okay, it is, but does the contract entitle it? So we look at all those effects and you are all, I'm sure, very familiar with that. But when you, when you see the prospective element, your project hasn't finished, you are impacting the program or you know, whatever impact or delay it has caused, you are identifying the critical path. And through the critical path, you're looking at, right, we are on 1st of November today, but because of those delays that happened between January and March, We've looked at the causation of those delays. We know there is three months delay during that period, but the project will now finish, not in January because of the three months delay. It could finish in February because of 
various reasons because you can't work in winter hours or there is a productivity loss and you you don't get to deliver the same output and that's where it gets really messy because you're now not only looking at prolongation you're also looking at disruption and i will i'll go more into detail on why these topics are so interrelated and need to be dealt with together because delay disruption prolongation disruption prolongation is your quantifying way of proving your delay so so we'll we'll go more into that when i'm discussing the main methods of delay analysis uh, as the previous chart showed uh, this has actually been taken from the society of construction law uh, scl delay protocol second edition which is very much utilized in majority of delay and quantum elements where such issues arise you can look at impacted as planned uh, time impact analysis time slice windows which is again a retrospective element as planned versus as built in my experience it depends on the project of what method you are using and uh, the whole idea is to determine the critical path now when when we look at a project and determine what method is to be used it's important that you agree it with the client as well that look to justify this delay we will use this method if it is not already mentioned in your contract because some contracts i've seen do mention that scl delay protocol may be or can be used and some of them actually specifically determine that if there is a delay on the project an extension of time is to be granted your submission needs to carry out as planned versus as built windows analysis or time slice windows analysis or something like that which is important the key element between time slice and as planned versus as built is a number of programs i'm not talking mega mega projects talking standard projects in the uk say 2 million 3 million 1 million pound not all programs have logic linked so the baseline program will be a list of activity with a gantt chart and that would be it and this is where it becomes very important that we discuss it with the client i was having this uh, recently where you know we're talking about okay so what is the critical path your your baseline program doesn't show a critical path well it's a common sense element you can actually see which activity is taking longer and which activity requires more duration or is going to cause a delay i mean you can't build a roof without having the walls it's it's just you know you may uh but i'm not talking about cladding cladding can come afterwards but it's just a generic you know uh discussion that it's a common sense element when we are looking at that one of the things that we have found and it's really important to look at when you are conducting your delay analysis whichever method is being chosen that we identify the correct baseline program. We establish a set of as-built and or progress data, whatever is available, because whichever method you are doing, you need contemporaneous records to determine the critical path or the activity, whether it's site meeting records, whether it's uh, your emails, whatever is happening, need to look at it. Now, to identify the critical delays and the cause of critical delay, um, it requires a factual analysis of the available data. Now, that data is through the baseline program, that data is through the site records, etc. But it becomes very important that we review all those records together, not in isolation, and then draft the sequence of works to determine the critical path and whatever effect happened on it. The causes and consequences of 
delays and the establishment of their root cause is the final result what we are after. Now, when we act as experts, the duty is not to the client, as you are all familiar with. The duty is to the tribunal, whether it's in adjudication, in arbitration, or at the TCC here in the UK. The whole perspective is to give it that independent opinion, looking at all the facts and data to justify how these events have attributed to this delay and then highlighting the cause of the delay and the effect of the delay. Effect and cause is also an element that needs to be looked into. But, but the, the, the whole idea is through these delay analysis methods is that we have a full quantification of the elements which have caused this critical part delay. I've got a few drawings and graphs later on that I want to show you in terms of determining uh, original plan, some critical delay, what has happened, how the program has been extended, but we will look into that when we look into uh, prolongation and disruption. So I'm going to move into the prolongation element because one of the thing is is to understand prolongation from the perspective of delay. Now, delay cost claims are claims for necessary logic or duration revisions adjusted to allow for mitigation measures and all excusable and compensable events during the delay's cost. Therefore, a delay cost is a claim for delay where a contractor or a consultant must show to the client that the cause of the delay is one that entitles them under the contract to payment for extra costs incurred. What does that mean in, in reality? In a construction and civil engineering project, we often make the mistake of believing that time and money are directly linked. They're not. We we assume that a financial claim recovery can only be secured if an extension of time has been granted. And conversely, that it will certainly be due if an extension of time has been given. No. Additional monies may be received, you know, a comprehensive extension of time and still not be entitled to additional financial recovery. So how do we do this financial recovery? What are your prolongation costs? You know, I've tried to show it on this graph in terms of your site overheads, your loss of profit, your unabsorbed overheads, and your offsite overheads. So all of these combined, you know, where you are showing that there is a critical delay that cannot be attributed, you know, to a particular activity, et cetera. So we need to look at it. Okay. A key element that I want to also talk about from here is that prolongation costs do not include direct or disruption costs. So when I say direct cost, those are the costs that are already in your BOQ or in your pricing mechanism, etc., that will be attributed to the project when the actual thing is delivered. If you're supposed to do something in January, couldn't do it, you're doing it in February, you're still getting paid for it for doing it in February. But the delay happened in January, what that delay cost? Prelims, et cetera, et cetera, site overheads, loss of profit. That's what we are after in prolongation cost claim. So what does a prolongation cost claim look like? What is the information needed in order to develop a prolongation cost claim? First of all, we need to know that there is a critical delay and we need to find out who's responsible for this delay. We need to understand whether it's a compensable critical delay and we have an entitlement to additional cost. That comes through your contract or applicable law. If the contract does not have a provision of extension of time, you can't claim it. You just carry on but the coming back to the question of extension of time why do clients need an extension of time clause in the contract 
because if they don't have an extension of time clause in the contract, they cannot hold their contractor or consultant accountable to when finish or completion will be achieved. Whether the contract includes delay damages, liquidated damages or not, you still need to have a date of completion and an extension of time attributable to it. There are a number of contracts I've seen where there is no liquidated damages clause, but because there is a compensable delay, the contractor is still expending more costs, so it still needs to request an extension of time. So the additional costs that were incurred during these periods of delay are what we need to identify. So this is your prelims, whether you have agreed prelims, your daily applicable cost, and we need to assess head office overheads. I mean, this is a number of times, and um, um, I, I know I'm, I'm giving this example that persons on, on this webinar today, is how do we recover senior management time? Because something has been delayed and it requires more input, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to look at how these costs have been implemented. We need to provide the prerequisite information, substantiation, how these people have actually spent time to make sure that whatever delays are or contributory acts have happened, we need to recover those and put them right. The, the, the other um, key element we need to look at is to establish whether there were any contractors concurrent critical delays or contributory acts. So the delay analysis review through which you are looking at your critical path and I'll show it in the next slide will provide an element of that throughout your bar chart as, as an example, where you're looking at D1, D2, and D3, where uh, these are different sorts of delay. Let's calculate the total delay, but in the end, later on, we identify that, oh, actually, uh, D1 was not attributable to the client. It was, uh, as an example, a contractor delay. So your extension of time will only come for D2, and D3 as, as an example. Okay. Now, <clears throat> entitlement again comes from the contract. Uh, I was a bit lazy, so I didn't choose NEC or JCT. I was doing a FIDIC 99 yellow book contract and just was highlighting some of the additional elements on that in terms of what are the causative events what are the claims that can be made where it contains provisions for the contractor to be able to recover cost uh, when it has suffered delays so some provisions uh, allow the contractor to claim reasonable profit uh, while others don't and um, people familiar you know from from this call in the uk we know under the nec provisions we add our fee at the end of it uh, in all compensation events. Uh, JCT, very similar. We will provide the quotation for variations under clause five and then review it accordingly if it deems a recovery of extension of time, additional profits, et cetera, as well. Uh, we do need to look at the applicable laws, uh, what they allow from an extension of time perspective. Um, in the UK, it's quite settled from that perspective in terms of how extension of time provisions work. And there is a plethora of case law that I'm sure you are mostly familiar with. Now, when we look at what costs do we need to recover, we are looking at categories of site overhead costs. So there is site management staff, site transportation, storage, all these additional things, welfare facilities. Uh, I'm sure a number of you will remember we had COVID three years ago and welfare facilities had to, had to be increased. And there was a lot of delay claims left, right, center from all sides in terms of how to manage it because 
the number of people on sites were less. We were doing things with social distancing initially. Uh, so all those things caused delay. So in, in assessing site overhead costs, several points need to be kept in mind. This is such as, you know, what your contractor is seeking to establish is because of events that have occurred and for which the contract provides an entitlement to an extension of time, actual resources of the type listed, in addition to those which otherwise would have been necessary, have had reasonably to be engaged on the project for the prolonged period. So this gives the answer of additional management on site uh, due to the prolongation happening and the prolongation part of the claim must relate to those periods when delay occurred. This will not necessarily be the overrun period, but when delays occur. Okay. So this is just an example of trying to represent it to the clients of how site overheads were different during the prolonged period. So the red line is the planned time related cost and the green line is the actual time related cost. So when delays happened in D1 and D2, we can then justify during those critical, critical compensable delays that there were actually additional resources and additional costs being spent on site. And hence, because these are compensable delays and we have prolongation in this time, we need to recover this additional cost. This is not your direct cost. Direct cost is as per the contract, whatever it is, this is all the indirect costs that you're looking at recovery from your client. Big example in terms of just you know showing the same graph in a table format to just show non-task related plant and equipment significantly higher during the delay periods for whatever reasons. Um, then you can I'm I'm going to go through these. You will get my slides later on. Um, we need to look at head office overheads. We need to look at the categories of head office overheads which could be anything because most contractors head office resources exist to support operations undertaken on site they're not just working on one project and and such head office overheads are normally taken as being recovered out of the income from the contractor's business as a whole so when when completion of one project has been delayed a contractor may claim to have suffered a loss arising from diminution of its income from the project reducing the turnover of their business. So despite this, the contractor continues to incur expenditure on, on head office overheads, which it cannot materially reduce or in respect of the project can only reduce, if at all, to a limited extent. So, so we need to find a way to recover these costs which could be professional fees which could be legal and audit fees administration costs salary and staff costs depreciation of plant if it's taken longer than what you had anticipated so these becomes your cost heads of claim which you will then make your submission to the client in terms of requesting prolongation costs i'm sure we are very familiar with hudson emden and eachley formulas uh, in terms of evidencing that the, the work available but for the delay could have been secured, we need to identify, and these are the most common formulas centered around identification uh, of head office overheads. And um, there are derivatives of these formulas, uh, but these are the, the most common. Now, while the use of formula has been heavily criticized by many commentators, there is existing judicial authority, specifically in the UK, for their use in certain instances. Um, so, so whatever formula you are using, just uh, remember that it's just there as means of assessing your quantum. The fact that 
there was an actual loss and that this loss flows directly from the relevant matter relevant event for the compensable delay it must be identified first so first you have to identify that there was a critical delay the formulas and everything else come afterwards during that period um, loss of profits again i've already mentioned it that there is huge debate on loss of profit is recoverable as part of a loss and expense claim you know if if the words direct loss and expense are to be interpreted as equivalent to the measure of damages at common law um in terms of breach of contract we need to think about can then there can really be no doubt that a contractor can claim for the loss of profit that they would have earned on the contracts had there been no delay or disruption to the project in question you know provided that such loss of profit was foreseeable or you can justify it and you can evidence it etc etc so loss of profit again various different commentaries you need to look at it in your contract from that perspective how much recovery can actually be made because if the contractor has mitigated the loss then there may be a permanent loss in income which is recoverable from the client as damages as well it's it's irrelevant whether the income lost uh, is profit or overheads or categorized in any other way i think i think that's the main thing but when you're doing the quantum of delay issues this becomes very important how do you quantify it and justify it because these earnings have to be shown whether they are shown through the the financial reports the accounting the previous two years and some contractors actually say uh, and i've had that that this was just um, after covid that because there was a massive slowdown in covid it doesn't justify what they could have done this year so it's irrelevant to look at those financial year incomes etc because of the slowdown in the market so it's horses for courses kind of scenario we need to look at how these things can be justified uh, interest and finance charges bank of england rate has skyrocketed if the contractor is owed money there needs to be an interest that comes with it uh, under a loss and expense claim so we need to we need to just look at that from that perspective because finance charges are attributable from that now interest in respect of monies owed is often dealt within the contract uh, generally there will be a clause on late payment of interest and things like that but we need to look at the level of inflation and the interest rates applicable at any point in time and the amount outstanding in respect of the loss and expense issues there's a common problems uh, just very quickly before we move into disruption uh, common problems that are encountered the the situation actually becomes more complicated when the contractor suffers delays to areas of work that are not on the critical path such a delay would not entitle the contractor to an extension of time as the completion date would have not been delayed and therefore prolongation costs could not be claimed now what happens in those situations in such situations a contractor could still have suffered a loss uh, as the result of actions by the employer but is unable to recover these costs under a prolongation claim of course but because losses suffered would not be to the contractor's indirect costs but instead to its direct costs so what happens now so however as the contractor is being paid for undertaking the works on the basis of the amount of work undertaken your boq your cost schedule activities whatever they are why would this lead to a loss when the contractor will ultimately be paid for the works completed so as i gave the example earlier you were doing some works in january it's not in critical path but now you have to do the works in february what happened you can't claim an extension of time you can't claim a prolongation but you were on site for that one week in January, but you couldn't do the works, and now you are doing the same thing in February. So, so we need to now look into that 
this loss when the contractor will ultimately be paid for the works is is different and and this is where we need to now think about the link on such issues how to make a contractor's claim for disruption so we've looked at prolongation which is on critical delay but there are issues that are happening on site but they are not prolongation because that's not on a critical path but it is now a disruption claim so so coming on to disruption it's it's very important to understand the distinction between claims for prolongation and claims for disruption the easiest distinction which a lot of commentators say is the way that direct and indirect cost elements are priced and paid for in different manners. So the pricing and payment for the actual work is based on the volume of work undertaken. Example, the amount of wall constructed, whereas the indirect costs are on the most part on the basis of time. For example, the duration of the plant being hired, the duration of the welfare facilities, uh, your prelims in, in, in general. So claims for prolongation costs, in theory, and I will use inverted commas, in theory, uh, relatively simple to prepare. And to do so, the contractor's time-related indirect costs, its preliminaries during the alleged employee's delay periods are quantified using accounts records, et cetera. So you know you've been delayed from January to February. It was on critical delay. You know what prelims there were. Now the project, which was supposed to finish in June, is now finishing in August. So you just simply apply that two months when you had the critical delay and make, make the cost submission. So in, in theory, prolongation cost claim is, is just establishing the additional cost of the contractor remaining on site for longer than planned, right? But, but how does a contractor recover the additional cost loss and expense of labor and plant that is the contractor's direct cost that is undertaking the physical works or indeed variation works but also ends up remaining on site longer so prolongation indirect cost and now you are talking about your direct cost through disruption so it's under the disruption claim that you will seek your recovery so these additional direct costs, and this would be a relatively simple calculation if the additional cost to the labor and plant were as a result of a suspension to the work. However, this is rarely the case of, of most disruption claims, which becomes more complicated, uh, when although delayed, the contractor's labor and plant is actually producing some amount of work and being paid for this work as it is completed. So there is um, uh, just want to you know uh, talk about the Society of Construction Laws view, or or their advice in this regard is that disruption claims relate to loss of productivity in the execution of particular work activities, and that because of disruption, these work activities are not able to be carried out as efficiently as reasonably planned. Or possible you know you plan something it doesn't happen you move on but you need to quantify it and recover it so the the society of construction law of course notes that where disruption events are the contractual responsibility of the other party the loss and expense incurred due to the loss of productivity may be compensable again going back to maybe because we need to see the relevant contractual entitlement, the relevant facts, the relevant provisions, um, and all the attributes that we looked at through our uh, prospective or retrospective analysis, et cetera. Now, we look at the perspective of disruption. So I've kind of given you a, a, a summary of a disruption claims because it's, it's additional cost, which is direct. So I planned to dig a hole in three days. It didn't work. I now dig a hole in seven days. 
for whatever reason, whether it was inclement weather, whether it was ground conditions, again, need to look at the contract, who's responsible for them, et cetera, et cetera. So any change in the method of performance or planned work sequence contemplated by the contractor at the time of the award that has prevented the contractor from actually performing in that manner, that is how you look at disruption. Uh, so loss of productivity, disturbance, et cetera. What is disruption doing is it's, it's entitling the contractor for extra payment either under a term of the contract or a breach of contract by the employer. Okay, So the claim, of course, must be supported by evidence of the facts on which it is based. So let's look at a quick comparison, delay and disruption. Uh, so a claim for delay involves the assertion that contract performance was extended and the completion date affected as a result of some events. Prolongation is a critical delay. Disruption is a non-critical delay, resulting in lower efficiency while carrying out your normal working methods. And, and, and this is why it becomes important that we find out the impact of disruption on performance. How do we do that? what is the loss of productivity? Uh, so I gave you my little digging a hole example, but there are several other examples that we want to look into in terms of understanding productivity. And then what are the common causes of the, you know, uh, disruption? Because loss productivity is a primary contributor to cost overruns that affect almost every construction project. Um, contractors can incur additional costs. I was on a site four or five years ago, and uh, we were building a port, uh, and this was just before COVID, yes, or during COVID, but we had a lot of storms and inclement weather and things like that. So where the crane operations were planned for three days, the cranes just couldn't operate. On, on those three days, it actually worked between five and six days because of the loss of productivity. Now you can go into inclement weather position and things like that, but the problem is that activity was not on a critical path. So the crane was only supposed to be on site for three days. So you're not asking for prolongation there, you're asking for disruption because instead of three days, now your crane's on site for four, five, six, or seven days. The cost is direct labor and plant, not site prelims, etc. So that's disruption as an example. Uh, the common causes of disruption, lots of them. Uh, the change in methodology, if you are doing out of sequence work, if you are trying to accelerate the job because of various reasons, and I'll try and cover acceleration later on as well. Adverse weather, I just gave an example. Site conditions, uh, couldn't dig the hole because there were underground services that weren't identified before. As an, there could be various examples. So, so claims under the contract, again, similar to entitlement to recover additional cost. Uh, we need to look at additional payment in the event that it suffers disruption or incurs additional cost. We need to look at all these specified events. We need to look at the profit margin disruption due to it need to look at the contract provisions and the applicable law. So this is again looking at highlighting all the common causes of disruption but then let's have a quick look at contractor caused disruption where things have taken longer. We're looking at a significant amount of data at the moment on design delays because nobody reasonably plans the time period for design reviews. You've thought about it, right? When the contractor submits their, you know, initial drawings, uh, we will only take a week to review it, and then the four construction drawings will be issued. And happy days, everything will be built on site. But we haven't thought about the comments exchange, red pens, 
uh, draft 9, draft 11, draft 27 of the drawing before it goes into construction. So that's delayed, you know, if there is, you know, sequencing of and the design is not really ready to be constructed. So we need to think about those elements as well. Project controls, lack of coordination, insufficient skill labor, late submissions. We don't often get labor strikes in the UK. But what if there are train strikes and the only way for labor to come to site on a Monday was through trains? Yeah, could be various different things. Um, recovery measures, who's responsible for what? Again, we when proving disruption, again, disruption cost claims are for additional costs associated with the disruption, cost to the progress for the execution of the works, et cetera, et cetera. We need to very much look into the liability, the causation, and the quantum. So causation is often the most difficult element to prove. When you're trying to prove, uh, you know, um, causation of your disruption, it becomes very challenging. Anyway, we've 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 found there is disruption. Now, how do you quantify it? And this is where we look at the different methods of quantifying disruption claims. Earned value analysis, measured mile. Most quantity surveyors are familiar with it. Most project controls, project managers, project leaders, we are all very familiar with these because it is a way of showing how the project has worked based on the circumstances. Uh, so for example, if we look at earned value analysis, it's comparing the planned performance with actual performance. And the actual performance is looking at uh, the earned value. So earned value is typically expressed as expected revenue to be generated per labor, uh, the hours expended on site or whatever it is. So, so that is your planned value. And then your actual cost and earned value are somewhat different. So there is a cost variance between actual cost and what the earned value is. And how do you justify the difference between them? Again, when it's earned value analysis, it's a bit easier to graphically present, but we need all the information that we need in terms of the actual percentage completion on site, the budgets to generate earned value metrics, uh, the actual revenue per hour of labor versus planned. Uh, we should have actually a fully resource loaded schedule uh, in order to undertake that, uh, how many projects actually have a fully resource loaded schedule? Because when you're looking at the actual cost, it's what has actually been spent on site. The plan cost is what the plan called for spending on the tasks plan to be completed by this date. So, so the earned value is what's been generated through your budgets, etc. So, we, again. Original estimates sometimes become challenging in terms of relying on them. Uh, there is a criticism on unreasonable budgeting and uh, becomes challenging unless you have full data of cost, time, et cetera, available. Then we're, we're familiar with measured mile method which again, it is determining the impacted discipline and scope of work to be used. We're, we're putting in fencing on a standard day, we are looking at achieving 500 meters a day. Okay, and just giving out strange numbers. But for some reason, now we are only achieving 400 meters a day. We need to find out what that reason is because your labor is the same, your plant is the same, but you're not achieving the same productivity that you achieved in the first three months. So, so there is a problem. So we need to look at the original hours. Uh, I should change the slide to original people hours, or we still can call it total man hours um, as, a, as a terminology, uh, but it's equally representative. Uh, so we need to estimate the loss of productivity due to the alleged employer caused impacts using the difference between contractors actual cost and what should have been cost. So 
the 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 information needed of course is your labor allocation your equipment and plant your labor costs uh, productivity data very important to have good productivity data on it so you can then demonstrate non-comparative benchmarks etc and separate it out in order to justify your claim um, there is lots and lots of industry studies uh, carried out uh, in a number of expert reports etc we would use bcis schedules etc uh, to, to say what the cost would have been and um, industry studies again we should only be doing once we've reasonably done uh, say earned value analysis didn't result in a good way or measured mile uh, has been exhausted only then we look into that so so there are lots and lots of guides and studies out there but we need to look at them in context and there should be very specific care needed when selecting an industry produced report or method then we come to total cost method okay it's a method for calculating damages and it's not a method of proving liability okay it's generally rejected for factual rather than legal reasons so we need to be very careful when we do a total cost method in terms of what the plan on the bid was what it has cost now what's the difference why the difference has happened this is the claimed amount this is the contract amount why do we need additional cost etc etc and uh, it's it, it's 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 a simple calculation but proof of causation does not differentiate between employers and contractors events so that's where you know some of the criticism comes in we then need to look at modified total cost method now this approach eliminates the dependence on the original estimate and accounts for non-owner related inefficiencies by requiring the contractor to deduct internal contractor cost factors so we are already looking at it so you've made some bid errors you've made some contractors uh, performance errors and non-compensable costs so you're only claiming for a proportion of the additional cost on the contract so you've already highlighted it to the employer that look yes we've messed up but 100 percent is not our messing and here is the proportion of it and if it's a gentle client highly unlikely you will uh, get your uh, uh, you know claim otherwise this is where the problems happen uh, that we get into disputes is because the, the simple definition of a dispute is when one or two or more parties don't agree or they have a misunderstanding so we're asking for X and they are giving us a percentage of X that's where disputes happen if both parties agree on the percentage or on x there is no dispute so we need to that's why these analysis become really important to highlight to the clients why we can recover the cost and uh, etc um, last slide on this is common problems encountered preparing disruption claims again the productivity data uh, the loss and causes cause and effect the, the the main crux of the point comes into there is a lot of concurrency mixed liability uh, that happens in it and we need to see the extent of records available in order to be able to to do this okay now acceleration i'm going to skip but you can just look at it later on it's basically when you are trying to recover a slipped program uh, whether the contractor has been given an instruction from the client or not uh, you are trying to put acceleration in and you need to look at specifically whether you have an instruction to accelerate whether there is enough data available whether you've given a written instruction from the client or can you recover the cost of acceleration there's some additional reading that I always suggest that we need to continue to actually understand and learn this topic. So, of course, the first thing I would say is read the Society of Construction Law Delay and Disruption Protocol. There is amazing 
prolongation and disruption guide available on HKA website. So all you have to do is just search, use your search engine and say uh, HKA disruption or HKA prolongation and you will receive that guide. Majority of the slides that I have presented today are from that guide, uh, which, which will be very useful for you because and on the slides I've given you, you know, small element on the guide, there is huge data available. And uh, you can also download the crux report because it's uh, providing you with the data globally on all claims and their causation. So when you look into these elements, it works pretty amazing. And on that, it's two o'clock. I bid farewell to you and say thank you very much for attending and majority of the people stayed throughout. So that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, my email is nasirkhan at hka.com. If you want to ask any questions, if you've got existing problems, issues or whatever, please get in touch and um, I look forward to hearing from you soon.